very happy to be here today with Michael Humer and Daniel Lehman. Uh, they'll be discussing um, uh, their recent uh, debate book about political authority. It's part of this bigger series uh, called Little Debates About Big Questions that Ty Goldschmidt and I are um, co-editing for Rutledge. So I plan to uh, do a number of uh, a number of discussions between the authors of these books as they come out. Um, there will be uh, one between Graham Oppie and Kenny Pierce uh, in a few weeks. They, they did a debate book about God. Um, so uh, uh, we'll start by having, uh, I guess, maybe both of you guys can uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, maybe Mike, you wanna go first? Yeah, I'm uh, Professor Michael Humer. I'm a philosophy professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, and um, I've, I've written about political authority before from a, a skeptical point of view, you might say. I've written, um, you know, several books that you can look up on Amazon and stuff like that. And um, a, a bunch of academic articles in epistemology, ethics, political philosophy, and a small amount of metaphysics. And uh, yeah, you know, one of the authors of this book that we're going to talk about. And Dan? Yeah, hi, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Dan Lehman. Um, I'm a philosophy professor at Davidson College in Davidson, North Carolina. I work on political philosophy, uh, the history of political thought, uh, things of that nature. Uh, in addition to co-editing, sorry, co-authoring this, I've written a book on Locke and the reception of his um, property theory in the 19th century and a bunch of articles on Locke and the concept of liberty and things like that. Um, yeah, very happy to be here. All right, uh, so the format will be that both authors will give kind of a brief summary statement of their position, of their argument, uh, and then we'll switch into free discussion afterwards. So um, Mike, uh, if you wanna give your statement. Yeah, so I'm gonna summarize what I said in the opening statement of the book. So there's a problem about political authority and uh, I'd like to explain it by giving a hypothetical example, you know, of, um, an, possible interactions among just ordinary people. So let's say that you live in a neighborhood and where there's you know a bit of a crime problem. There are these vandals who are periodically damaging people's property and whatever. And so imagine that I decide one day that I'm going to do something about this. And so I, I and my family decide to go around looking for vandals. And when we find one, we kidnap them and then we lock them in a, in a little cage in our basement. And so, Okay, it's a little bit weird. <laughs> it's a little, a little questionable. And then I go around the neighborhood, um, you know, knocking on people's doors and saying, hey, you know, you owe me money for, uh, you know, keeping the peace, whatever, because I'm capturing vandals and locking them in a cage. Now you have to pay me. Right. And then these people are like, well, I never agreed to pay you. And I'm like, well, you know, you got to pay me anyway, because otherwise I'm going to label you a criminal. And then I will take you captive and lock you in a cage in my basement. All right. And most people think that, um, no, this isn't OK. And that most people think that they do not owe me money in that scenario and that I'm not entitled to force them to pay. Uh, and, you know, then you can imagine that I start making up further rules for people in the neighborhood. I start going, oh, well, I've decided that there are certain substances that you're not allowed to consume. And if you do, then I'm going to kidnap you and, you know, lock, lock you in the basement and so on. And most people think I don't have any right to do that either. And what you might be noticing is that my behavior in this story is kind of like the behavior of a government. Like I'm, I'm a rudimentary government, or at least if I succeed, then I am, right? Um, and so then there's a question of, you know, like why we think it's cool if the government does these things and we wouldn't think it was cool if I did it. All right, and so, you know, the answer to that, just like, um, you know, as a philosophical theory is that the government has authority and I don't have any authority. And so this is to introduce the idea of authority, like the idea of the government's authority that, I mean, that's sort of like just putting a label on it. That doesn't really explain why it's okay for the government, but, you know, the idea of authority is they've got this kind of special moral status that makes it so that they're entitled to give commands to others and and force people to obey them with threats of violence. Uh, and also makes it so that the rest of us have some kind of obligation to obey them. Right, and so then, yeah, now the philosophical question is, well, why, why would anyone have authority? 
And so I've always found this pretty puzzling. I don't understand how some people are special and like get to tell other people what to do. And so, you know, my theory is uh, no, no one has ever had that kind of authority. It's just this illusion. It's a thing that the people in power made up to try to convince us to obey them, but nobody ever ac actually has such a special moral status. Okay, so I got to say some things about reasons that people have given for why the state would have authority. The most popular thing that you hear is, oh, there's this thing called a social contract whereby we've all agreed to have the government and we've agreed to obey them. And in return, they agreed to protect us and whatever, you know, provide law and order and um, uh, capture criminals and things like that. All right, so, and what's wrong with this? The, the main thing that's wrong with this is that uh, it's factually false that there never, in fact, was any such agreement. Nobody ever came to me and presented a contract and had me sign it. The most popular thing to say is that, oh, it's an implicit agreement, which means that although you didn't actually say you agreed, you somehow implied that you agreed with your behavior. And then you ask, oh, well, what did I do that implies that I agree? And then uh, the most popular things that people say are, um, you know, maybe like, maybe you agree just by not objecting. And uh, you know, the main problem with this is, no, if you do explicitly object, the government still imposes exactly the same laws on you. Right? And then, um, well, maybe I agreed by accepting benefits from the state. But actually, if you don't accept benefits from the state, they still impose exactly the same laws on you. Um, and plus, you know, like many of the benefits, you don't actually have a choice about. So like, the, or alleged benefits, right? So like the government has uh, the benefit of the military. And if you don't want that, too bad. You have to have it. Well, you can't really say that somebody has agreed to an arrangement that you made up because you forced them to take certain benefits, right? Whether they wanted them or not, right? Um, another thing, uh, the most popular thing that people say is maybe, oh, you agree just by being present, just by being in a certain location. Right, so I think this is kind of like the following modification of my story. Like I'm going around the neighborhood and um, people are like, oh, I, I never agreed to pay you, sorry. And I say, no, you did agree. You know why? Because you're living in your house. You're living in your own house on your own property and that means that you agree to pay me. And if you don't want to pay me, then now you have to get out of your own house and move to Antarctica because that's the only landmass in the world that doesn't have a government, right? If you don't, if you don't want to agree, that's what you have to do. All right, uh, other thing, okay. Um, usually if you have a contract, um, you can get, you can avoid agreeing to a contract by explicitly saying that you don't agree, but that doesn't work with a supposed social contract. If you, you can send a letter to the government that explicitly says, I don't agree, and they will still say, nope, you still got to do everything. We don't give a shit that you don't agree. All right. Um, Okay, and then, you know, another thing to point out is actually the government hasn't agreed to do anything for you. So it's a, you know, official legal doctrine in the United States that the government is, has no obligations to provide any public services to any individual. So thus, if you try to sue the government for failing to provide services to you, like you called the police and they never came, and, you know, you were victimized by criminals because of that, and it could be as negligent or intentional as you like, and the government will still say, nope, you lose. They will dismiss your lawsuit summarily, right? Meaning that you won't even get to argue the case in court because of the government's doctrine that they're not obligated to do anything for you, right? So that makes it sound like not that much of a contract. Um, another thing people say is um, there's a hypothetical social contract theory, which is they say, well, okay, so you didn't actually make this agreement, but you would have agreed if we were in a scenario where we didn't yet have a government and you were perfectly rational, you would have agreed to establish one. Um, I guess the shortest thing to say about this is, you know, imagine a hypothetical case. So um, say there's an accident victim who um, is unconscious and they need medical treatment then it is okay to treat the accident victim without their consent because they're unable to give it and because you could reasonably infer that they probably would consent to medical treatment that was necessary, you know, based upon the values that most people have, right? And if you, if you don't know anything else. 
A uh, problem with this for the um, alleged social contract is, well, we're not all unconscious. So the government could ask us. And the reason they're not actually asking us is that they know that too many people would say no. If the result, and you know, so most people say, no, no, I want a government. But if the result of saying, no, I don't want a government was that you don't have to pay any taxes, a lot of people would say no, right? And then, so that's why we don't ask, okay? But you can't, you can't say, oh, well, you know, we get to impose this arrangement because you know, we're not going to actually ask people because we're afraid they would say no. Uh, okay, uh, another popular thing people say is that in some way the democratic process confers authority on the state. Um, and then, you know, I think you could imagine this hypothetical scenario where um, this would seem counterintuitive. So let's say, you know, I'm at a dinner, uh, I'm at a dinner with several people, you know, some other, some philosophy students and, you know, another professor or whatever. And, uh, you know, at the end of the meal, we're deciding on how the bill should be divided up. And I say, oh, you know, let's just divide it equally. And then one of the students says, no, I think Mike Humor should pay for everyone. And I say, no, I don't, I'm not agreeing to pay for everyone. <laughs> and then, you know, the other students say, well, let's just take a vote, right? And then it turns out that, you know, like three or five people, not including me, uh, so I vote no, I don't have to pay for everyone, but three other people vote yes, I have to pay for everyone. And there's more of them than there are of me. So am I now obligated to pay for everyone? And like that seems false, I'm not obligated. And plus they're not ethically entitled to force me to pay, right? And so then, you know, in general, just a majority of people wanting something doesn't overcome what would normally be your rights. It doesn't overcome your right to your own property, for example. Um, and this is uh, this strikes me as you know a pretty fair analogy to uh, actual democratic governments. Okay, um, let's see. The last thing that people sometimes say is, "Oh, well, we need a state because it provides very large benefits, and like bad stuff is going to happen if we don't have a government." Uh, and now I should point out that my argument here is not whether government is useful; it's whether they have authority. So the question is whether they have this special moral status that differentiates them, kind of like puts them above everyone else. The question is not whether they're doing something useful. Okay, now you could try to say, well, they have authority because like we have to act as if they have authority in order for them to do this useful thing. So here my analogy is, uh, so we're on a lifeboat and the lifeboat needs to be bailed out. And for some reason, people are not voluntarily bailing it out. And so one person, you know, threatens everyone else with violence unless they bail out the boat. And it kind of seems like that's justified. Okay, and so that's supposed to be like an analogy for the government. They have to force everyone to obey the law, otherwise society will collapse and it's going to be really bad. Um, and now what you should notice about this is, uh, so that does seem permissible, but it's only okay for the person to do the minimal amount of force necessary to save the lifeboat. He cannot then go around and just dictate, you know, random other unrelated things on the lifeboat, which is kind of like what the government does. The government not only provides law and order, not only provides, you know, essential goods to keep society running, but it just does a whole bunch of other stuff that's not necessary for that, and, and including a bunch of stuff that's actually harmful. And the people who believe in authority think that you have to obey the laws, even when the laws themselves are not good laws. You even have to obey the ones that are harmful, right? And so, you know, in the lifeboat example, you wouldn't have to obey that guy if he's saying stuff that's actually harmful to the boat. You only you you should bail out the boat, but you don't have to do a bunch of other stuff that that's not actually beneficial. Okay, all right, uh, I've gone on for long enough, so I'm gonna just stop there. So, um, you know, conclusion, authority is an illusion. Yeah, and Mike, so I take it, <clears throat> the sort of the kernel of your idea is the government claims to be able to do things that it would be wrong for a private citizen to do. That's puzzling, that needs, there has to be some sort of justification for why it can do these things that other people can't do. Uh, and then people have given all these proposed explanations and you think they all fail. That's, is that a fair? Yeah, a, a yeah. good summary. Yeah, yeah. good. Okay, um, Daniel. All right. Um, so I now have the task of replying. Um, so I'll start by saying, I agree that 
the consent theory of political theory of political authority, which Mike discussed, is not successful um, at all. I'm not going to defend any form of that. Um, I also don't want to defend the sort of any kind of straightforward conferral of benefits account or a just um, sort of reasoning from you know majority voting in general to some kind of authority for the state in particular um, kind of argument. I think all those are unsuccessful arguments. Um, however, I do think that states can and often, though not always, do have political authority to a pretty substantial degree. Um, and I want to take these 10 minutes to go through why I think that is the case. So I think one way in which Mike and I do agree is that we think that rights are, are uh, the core or is at the core of any plausible story here. The, the problem of political authority really is a problem about rights. I think that's exactly correct. Right? But whereas Mike thinks that a commitment to rights get sort of rules out um, political authority, I think that a commitment to right um, rules in political authority. In fact, insofar as we're committed to rights and take rights seriously, we have to be committed to political authority. So we are starting from this uh, common point of reference. And I think that's important to take note of. That we're not, it's not as though I'm saying, look, there's something other than rights that's really the core here. Um, I do think rights are the core here. Um, I just think that we should reason from the starting point of taking rights extremely seriously to a different conclusion. Okay, so what are rights? What are we talking about here? Um, I think when we're talking about rights, and this goes for both of us, we're talking about rights in the sense of, of claim rights. So one sense of having a right to something is just being allowed to do it. So in the just being allowed sense, which is sometimes called a permission, if I encounter a quarter, a random coin on the sidewalk, I have a right to pick it up in the sense that I'm not forbidden to pick it up, right? But so too, does everyone else have that right? If they get to it first, I have no standing to complain. Why? Because my right was only a permission. It wasn't a claim. The, the quarter was not mine, right? But in another sense, we have rights to things when we have claims to them. So this fine, oddly titled quality choice title company, I don't know what this is. This uh, mug that I guess I got from my parents at some point is mine now. Why? Well, because they gave it to me. And this, among other things, means that I have a claim to it. So um, I am permitted to drink from it, but I'm also entitled to claim that insist that no one else, I don't know, take it, break it, snatch it from me, hide it in a different cupboard, what have you. Why? Because I have a claim right to this. Okay. And the philosopher H.L.A. Hart really helpfully described rights of this kind, which is the kind that we'll be talking about, I think, in the rest of this discussion, um, as a kind of right that it makes the right holder a, as he said, small scale sovereign within its scope. So insofar as I have a right with respect to some thing or some choice or some set of things or set of choices, that means that what I say goes with respect to that. Um, and the good of having rights is that it carves out these spaces of um, small scale sovereignty, right? That are really good for us. Why? Well, one, they allow us to authorit authoritatively plan and execute our own projects on our own terms. And they allow us to do that while respecting one another as equals. So starting with this idea of rights as claims, right? Let's think about how those rights can be violated, right? How could you how you can lose the freedom, right, or fail to enjoy the freedom that those rights promise and that makes them so significant. Right? So one way that I think is pretty obvious is that someone can, as I'll say, invade your rights. They can come and mess with the thing or space of action that is yours, right? So if someone were to knock this fine mug out of my hands or something of that character, that would invade my right to my mug. Okay. But remember, the point of rights is not just that certain physical things not happen to you, right? It's that you enjoy a kind of sovereignty within their space. So another kind of way in which your rights can be um, violated, in which you can, on account of others, lose your freedom within your rights is for your rights, as I say, to be vitiated. That is for someone else to enjoy 
arbitrary power within their scope. Okay, so suppose that um, with this mug, I do in fact um, get to enjoy it. I can drink out of it, hold it, or whatever. But suppose this is a bit fanciful, but bear with me. Suppose there is this um, sort of a mug authority or mug villain, right, as the case may be, who's just sort of um, standing by, right? And for any or no reason, the mug could be snatched from me or broken or hidden or what have you. It's not because the mug villain can't be bothered to do that or is distracted or doesn't care or likes me or whatever. Um, but nonetheless, the villain has that standing. Insofar as that's true, I want to say I don't enjoy my right. Why? Because it's just pure luck, right? Someone else's personal will that makes it the case that I get to use the mug. And that means that other person is sovereign within that space to not me. And if the point of rights is that you enjoy sovereignty within their space, that's um, the kind of arbitrary power within rights I'm describing is going to be sufficient to violate them or um, render them um, useless with respect to your freedom. OK, so why talk about this? The reason is that I think in the absence of government in what we sometimes call a state of nature, that just means for the sake of this discussion, any state of affairs in which there is no state, right? A state of nature is a condition in which our rights are subject to three defects, right? at least three. There may be more, but at least three defects. Um, and these defects are sufficient to vitiate our rights. That is, um, subject them to arbitrary power in a way that um, destroys their value to us right? as, um, as sources of our freedom. So one is the what I might call the legislative, what I do call in the book, the legislative defect. So the legislative defect is that in the state of nature, in a state of nature, our rights are going to be, um, to some considerable degree at least, um, indeterminate in their content, right? So we can vary this out by thinking a little bit about an example from the philosopher John Locke. So John Locke tells us sort of plausibly, I guess, um, that we can acquire rights to objects in the world by incorporating them into our work or our action, as he sometimes says. Okay, so how exactly does this work? He gives us this example of, um, he likes hunting examples. He gives us this example of chasing a hare, right? So he says, as soon as you give chase to the hare, the hare is yours because you know, you're chasing it. Right? Okay, well, so suppose that you know, the hare is leading me back to a nest or to a whole field, right? And I want to incorporate all the other rabbits or the field into my plans too. Or maybe I want to incorporate a whole at a region of fields and I'm pursuing the one rabbit to, to bring about this big project. How do we carve up the world into right? This is a hard question and Locke gives us no serious answer. And it looks like we're gonna need some kind of um, way of altogether um, determining those indeterminate or incomplete rights. Okay, that's the legislative defect. Second, the judicial defect. Even insofar as we do get determinate content for our rights in the state of nature, there's a problem of indeterminacy in their application. So there are often cases in real life where people agree that some kind of right exists, say a right to be free from dangerously slippy st slippery stairs. Right? They disagree about how that right should be applied. Right? They disagree about whether someone owes someone money, say, um, pursuant to that right. And they go to court. Okay. In the state of nature, we have this, as I say, judicial defect that leads to an absence of, of determining, determining applications of rights. And in the absence of a kind of um, sort of systematic, um, mutually affirmed way of doing that, those are going to be determined just by whoever is able to enforce his or her, her will. Right? And that'll be subjection to arbitrary power. And then moreover, there's what we might call the executive defect, that is, whether and to what extent rights are going to be actually executed and enforced is not going to depend on some sort of um, systematic um, set of constraints we all endorse together because by hypothesis, there is no such thing. They'll just depend on the will of powerful people. Okay, so to remedy these three defects, at least these three, again, there may be more, but the, to remedy at least these defects, we need an authority that can correct them, right? While somehow, being accountable equally to all the people for whom it performs the correction, right? And that last bit is important, the accountability bit, because if that's not there, we're just gonna reproduce the problem, right? 
So if we have in the state of nature, some really, I don't know, public spirited and very powerful individual, maybe a bit like Mike's vigilante, um, who does in fact want to, I don't know, settle disputes, determine rights and um, bring about assurance through execution, but just is accountable to no one, just does this and is able to bring it about because she or they or he or whatever is smart or powerful or something, right? Well, then we haven't solved the problem, right? Because we're still within the scope of our rights, just subject to the discretion, not now maybe of a, a whole bunch of random people, but of this one powerful person, right? So if this is gonna solve, if we're gonna have a solution to this problem, we need the entity that does the solving to be accountable, not just to one person or some few people, but to everyone, right? And to everyone equally, right? So that the, um, the rights that need to be uh, defined, um, adjudicated and enforced can be done in a way that reflects the equal status of right holders, as right holders, excuse me, of everyone involved. Okay. So what is this going to amount to? I think we're gonna need a democratic government. Now, why a democratic government, right? Because, well, by government, right, I just mean some kind of entity that can and does solve these defects under conditions, right? That can be at least um, equally accountable to all. Now, I don't mean to insist that everything that is a government has this property, right? We can all think of governments of states that do not have this property. We can think of states right now. So for instance, arguably the state of Venezuela does not have this property. Various other kinds of um, authoritarian states do not have this property. Those are states and do not adequately or at all perhaps address these problems. Why? Because they're not subject to, as I say, equal basic accountability. But any entity that is able and willing to correct these problems, right? under conditions of equal basic accountability just will be a state right, of a certain kind. It'll be a democratic state. So we cannot reason from X is a state to X adequately solves this problem, right? That's a bad inference. But we can reason from, oh, X adequately solves this problem. X must be a state of a certain kind, right? Because if, if it were not an entity willing and able to do this on conditions of um, equal basic accountability, um, it would uh, not address the problems that we've been discussing. Okay, so let's now talk about why such an entity is legitimate, that is why does it have a right to tell us what to do? Two, why are we obligated to do what it says? Right? And legitimacy and obligation, I agree with Mike, together constitute authority, right? So. Legitimacy, why does the kind of state I'm describing have the right to tell us what to do? Well, because a properly democratic government has a right to rule because it's doing so as a precondition for our enjoying freedom within our rights at all, right? So let's take the right not to be locked in a basement by your neighbor, which Mike was discussing. I think I have that right. I think you all have that right as well. Okay. now. Suppose that we did live in a state of nature, right? We, there is no government. There's just a bunch of people um, and basements and projects and so forth. Okay. Suppose that um, you um, are in fact not being locked in a basement by anyone, right? Why? Because none of the people who are able to bring about locking you in the basement feel like doing so. Were they to begin to feel like doing so, they'd be accountable to exactly no one for refraining from doing so. Under those conditions, the fact that you're not locked in a basement is in a way sheer luck. You just happen to be surrounded by people with a certain kind of dispositions, right? So you're not sovereign within, with respect to that choice. And so you don't enjoy freedom within that right, right? By solving the state of nature defects, um, a properly accountable government can make it the case that with respect to individual rights, we do determinately and, ju and judiciably and subject to assurance, enjoy sovereignty within the spaces of those choices. Without that, without the state that is, without the proper kind of state, we simply don't have um, that way of enjoying freedom within our rights. For the reason the state, at least the right kind of state, has um, standing to tell, to issue and enforce its, its laws, which, um, resolve these state of nature defects 
is that that's a precondition of us enjoying freedom with our in our rights at all, right? That's the reason why um, we can we can be um, subject to legitimate force by a state. Now, I should note, it's important to emphasize legitimacy can and does come in degrees. It's tempting to think that a state is either um, all the way legitimate or all the way illegitimate. I do not take that to be the case. I think that's deeply implausible. Right? All states, and very much including the United States, suffer from significant damage to their legitimacy. Why? Insofar as they do things of the kind that Mike was bringing up, right? Um, do things that seem to undermine their standing um, as an accountable entity for enforcing our rights. Insofar as that occurs, legitimacy is damaged. Right? So I think we can dis uh, distinguish between uh, failed states those are states that um, fail to achieve legitim legitimacy so dramatically that we'd be better off um, with respect to our rights to just get rid of them and start over, right? And then flawed states, which include all the other states, right? So United States, Great Britain, Japan, Germany, all will be flawed in, in some ways quite significantly so, right? That's important to emphasize. Obligation, why do we have to do what the state has a right to enforce us to do? Well, insofar as the properly accountable state makes it possible for us to enjoy equal freedom within our rights, we respect our fellow citizens and their rights um, insofar as we all together um, respect the conditions that make our freedom within our rights possible. Okay. Now, there's two more features worth touching on. One is what we might call content independence, and Mike mentioned this earlier. So in order for an account of authority to go through, the state has to be able to enjoy legitimate authority and we have to have obligation within a pretty wide range of actual laws passed and enforced by the state. So if there's some small set of things we're all required to do anyway, I don't know, be nice to each other, or call your parents sometimes, I don't know, um, don't steal. If, if there's a, a set of pre-existing rules and they're pretty narrow and that's the only space within which we have to obey the state, that's not gonna count, cut it for an account of political authority, right? There has to be some pretty significant room within which the fact of the right kind of states having, to having told you to do something is a reason, a moral reason for you to do it, right? And then particularity is the issue of um, why individuals have these duties to particular states, right? So why do I have a duty to obey the United States, say, and not Belize or some other nation? So with content independence, I think um, we can notice that any fairly um, recognizable complicated form of political life is going to feature um, what we might call permanent reasonable disagreement right, about how the state ought to go about determining, adjudicating, and enforcing our rights. You'll notice this with many kinds of um, policies that exist today. Our uh, political life is just overrun with disagreements, many of which are, I think, and we ought to do better at recognizing quite reasonable. So in the book, I use the example of the FDA, that is the Federal um, the, sorry, the Food and Drug Administration of the United States, which is an agency that passes various laws for testing food and drugs. Okay. What should that entity be like? Well, some people argue that it should be far more stringent than it is currently. It's already quite stringent, right? It should be um, sort of slower, do more testing, take more time to uh, license food and drug. Some people think it's about okay as it is. Some people think it shouldn't exist. Some people think that the, um, the FDA is a just a kind of um, blood sucking agency that has no you know, proper claim in our behavior at all. Uh, I think we should grant that this kind of question to what extent, if at all, should we have an agency that manages our food and drug quality? Is a subject of reasonable disagreement right, about how the state should manage um, the task of defining, adjudicating, and enforcing our rights. And because this is a scope within which people all concerned with equal accountability under adequate law can and do disagree, right? we should, after duly accountable democratic deliberation, um, you typically, barring civil disobedience, which I'll close with in a second, um, obey the government within that scope. Particularity, why should we 
obey our particular government as opposed to any old government? Well, it's only our particular government that does the work of creating the conditions of our freedom within our rights, right? So to the extent that I'm American, live my life in the United States, have my property here, et cetera, it's that government which does the work of correcting the state of nature defects with respect to me and my freedom within rights, right? So that's the ground of my particular obligation to that state. And then finally, as promised, I should note, I do not mean to claim that the um, citizen of this kind of state should simply always obey the law. There are laws that absolutely may and even should be broken. Why? Because disagreement is not always reasonable. So under cases where the, uh, the citizen determines this is simply too evil to obey, it seems to me quite clear the citizen may and indeed sometimes should um, conduct that disobedience. However, it seems to me that, and has to many uh, working in this tradition, that in order to continue respecting one another, right, and to respect, as you might say, the law, while not respecting or obeying a particular law, we ought to break the law under those conditions in ways that are communicative, as in ways that attempt to convince our fellow citizens that the law is evil and must be changed, and relatedly in ways that are open, right, in ways that make clear what we're doing and which don't uh, in, involve attempts at evasion uh, for the consequences of what we're doing. Okay, so that was the um, lightning fast rundown. There's lots there and I'll be happy to discuss. Okay. So to, to try to get at the kernel of your argument, Daniel, um, mm -hmm. uh, tell me if this is if this is the thought. So you agree with Mike about the central importance of rights. You're thinking <clears throat> the function of rights is to sort of carve out spheres within which people can be free and equal citizens, can live their own lives without um, being interfered with by others and without being subject to interference. So it's not enough just that Mike doesn't actually want to interfere with me. It would be bad if he could interfere with me with impunity. Um, People sometimes use the example of like a benevolent slave owner. Suppose I'm enslaved and in fact, my slave master just lets me do whatever I want. Uh, you know, he's just worried about other things. Like that's still bad because he could interfere with my basic rights, right? Um, and so what uh, rights are supposed to do is carve out these spheres within which we can all live freely without being subject to others interfering with us uh, with impunity for bad reasons for whatever. Um, and in the absence of a state, uh, this can't happen because uh, first of all, there might not be any fact of the matter about how to carve up these spheres. There are different reasonable property regimes and things. Um, Second of all, people are not going to agree about how to carve them up. So they, even if they're well-meaning, they'll be interfering in other people's spheres. Um, and then third of all, there's no way to enforce, um, you know, in, ensuring that people's spheres are respected. Whoever's the strongest person can come along and, and crush me and make me do what they want. And so we need a government uh, to make precise what the rules are to settle disputes between people and to enforce uh, people's rights. Um, and someone might think, well, wait a minute, haven't we just created an, a, a new entity that is like super dangerous to our rights because it's like super powerful and it can do anything. And you say, um, not if the government is subject to democratic accountability in the right way because then we have power over the government uh, to prevent it from arbitrarily interfering, um, you know, ideally through voting, maybe through civil resistance or, you know, whatever. Uh, and um, this is what keeps the, the government from just being a new, a new dominating agent. And the need for the government to carve out these spheres and protect them is what gives it the, the right to, uh, govern and creates our obligations to, to listen to it. Something like that? Yeah, very, yeah, okay. very, very right. good. Thanks, Dustin, right. that was a, a good summing up. Yeah, great, yeah. great. Um, Mike? Um, yeah, so I mean, so it sounded like, um, you know, like a problem in the state of nature, the problem of our rights being, quote, vitiated um, is just the descriptive fact that somebody has the ability to invade our rights. 
Um, but I don't see how there's any solution to that. So having a government doesn't make it so that nobody is physically able to invade your rights. And indeed, that it goes on. You know, there's a thing called crime is still happening. So people are still invading people's rights. But you know, the existence of a government does mean that now there's an additional agent that could invade your rights, which is the government. And you say, OK, yeah, but it's a democratic government, so we could vote people out of office. Yes, but that doesn't make it so that they're not able to invade your rights. So it's just a matter of luck, right? And plus, now you're just mentioning another group of people who could invade your rights, which is the voters. So, you know, now the voters could vote to, you know, like the majority could vote to invade the rights of the minority. And so, like, I think, I mean, I don't see how we don't just have the same problem, but, you know, like three instances of it. Yeah. So this is a classic problem for the, um, this kind of view, which is sometimes called a Republican view, because it has to do with this idea of a classical republic. Um, so a long time ago, um, the now sadly uh, deceased philosopher Jerry Gauss gave an ex example of um, someone being at a conference and there's like a jug of water on the conference table. And of course, it's physically possible for any member of the discussion around the table to grab the pitcher and smash someone over the head with it. Right. That's compatible with the laws of physics as often um, happens yeah right when things get really nasty these rowdy philosophers yeah watch out kids philosophy conferences get dark quickly um but um seriously though that of course could happen now if that would be very surprising um a lot of bad consequences would ensue presumably for the head smasher um if if that were to happen but gauss is no doubt correct that in that sense of can right relative to the, the laws of psychology and physics um the, the head smashing could occur. And I think we can assume safely enough that we probably have a right not to have our heads smashed with um, uh, pitchers at conferences. Okay. So that right is in some sense subject to the arbitrary will of all of us because we're all would be head smashers. Okay. So I think this is a problem if you understand the relevant um, can of can anyone do this, right? To um, be the can of psychology or physics or the combination of psychology and physics. I don't know. Maybe those are the same at bottom. Um, but that I don't think is the relevant sense of, of can or able here, right? So the relevant sense of can or able is, is morally laden, right? In a way that the laws of physics presumably are not. So the sense in which no one can um, smash a fellow conference goer over the head has to do with standing or authorization, right? Together with um, sort of, and this is less morally laden, with institutions of, of backup. So the question is not, is it physically possible, but does anyone have standing to do this, right? Such that in the relevant context, because that person felt like it counts as a justification, right? That the other people involved, including the institutions of law and government in play, or recognize. If it's the case, as I assume it would be, say, at the American Philosophical Association, right, that anyone who conducted such an act of head smashing would be, and predictably and intentionally so, right, subject to immediate severe penalty for that reason, right, um, and probably with withheld and restrained from any further interaction at the conference, certainly. That is going to be- Maybe the other problem. philosophers would just flee the room. <laughs> that's actually, yeah, that's, that's pretty likely. Um, <laughs> But anyway, that would be sufficient for there be, for that person being in the relevant sense, um, unable in the sense sort of institutionally unauthorized, um, lacking the standing uh, to do the head smashing. Yeah. That's that's the sense in which um, we're talking about um, the the possibility right, yeah. involved in the, these re Republican liberty claims. So to sum up, there is a causal element. If someone, if everyone's just going to say hey, that was really bad. We don't morally do that sort of thing around here. But I guess carry on, right? In that case, <laughs> there still is arbitrary power. Oh. But if by the same token, um, we think, well, we just need to only think about the laws of physics here, that's also a mistake. Uh, the, yeah. the kind of can that's relevant is the can of sort of institutionalized um, normative standing. And that's what I mean yeah. to say. Well, I mean, so like you started by saying can is morally laden, but the description that you gave maybe uh, maybe wasn't so like if it if it's oh you can't do this in the sense that 
you don't have the moral standing to do it. Oh, well, we don't need a government for that. You don't have the moral standing to violate somebody's rights, no matter what, whether you're in anarchy or a state. Okay, but then the thought is, oh, no, no, like I didn't just mean it's not like morally permitted. I meant like uh, we have social institutions that will punish you or something like that. Like, uh, okay, I mean, yeah, that seems like an improvement, although I'm not sure that that, um, like if, um, I'm not sure that that's what matters rather than say the probability of the invasion actually happening, right? And so like, uh, okay, you know, we have crimes going on and people are invading other people's rights and there is an institution that is supposed to catch the criminals and, you know, <laughs> which they usually don't do, but anyway, but the institution is supposed to catch and punish criminals, which they do like, you know, maybe a third or whatever, you know, maybe a quarter of the time or something like that. And like, okay, that's great. Improvement. I'm not sure that that's a huge improvement. I'm not sure that it matters, you know, that, that, that it matters that there's this institutional whatever structure rather than just whether the thing is actually happening or what's the probability. But anyway, the other thing that I want to worry about is, well, wait, you know, like the state could invade your rights and then there's no institution that punishes them for doing that. And then you're like, oh, well, like the voters could vote the politicians out of office. Okay, true, but actually like most of the people who could be invading your rights are not even elected. Like if the cops beat you up, they're not elected. Uh, now, you, you know, they could be fired by the mayor or something like that, but this is like a really indirect mechanism. You try to put pressure on the mayor. Okay, and then, you know, after the cops beat you up and you're trying to pressure the mayor, the actual probability that you're going to cause the cops to get in trouble is next to zero. The most that happens is like, maybe they get fired, like you can't prosecute them or anything like that. So, um, and then you're like, okay, but now like I have to get, a, I have to get like millions of other voters to agree with me in order to get anything, anything done. So like, I'm not sure how much this is helping me. And then it's like, what if the other voters don't care about me, right? Because like, you know, what if the majority decide that they want to invade the rights of the minority, which is not like an outlandish alternative possible world, right? Like this has happened frequently in democratic countries and they're like, and there's no way of holding the majority accountable. They never get punished you know, for voting for evil things. So, you know, like, yeah. yeah, don't we still have the same kind of problem? So, so I think that there's a, actually a, a few thoughts in there. The most basic point is the one about probability. I'll take that first. And then there are less basic ones. So I don't think that probability can really be what matters um, in terms of one's liberty from arbitrary power. And we can see that by going back to the case, which is a famous case that Dustin brought up of the benevolent slave owner, right? So there could be, and probably in fact have been um, cases of full-blown slave owning, right? Someone is in legally and in every sense of uh, the owner of, um, or not morally, of course, but in all institutional um, senses, the owner of another person, what they get to do, what they get to eat, who they get to talk to, whether and how they get educated, you name it, all depends on the will of the slaver, right? But suppose the slaver is like really, really stable, right? In his or her behavior, right? Maybe as um, the very, very, very um, stable dispositions has acted the same way for 20 or 30 years. Um, suppose that the um, all the slaves believe totally rationally, right? That the probability of um, changes really low we can just stipulate they're right right it can become the case that pro the probability of sudden behavior change is very low um, so they can predict um, ac accurately what the slaver will do they can plan their courses of action they know with extremely high degrees of certainty what the um, um, obstacles they will or won't face will be it seems clear um, as it has to to most people that that predictability of the slaver Right, and let's say it's predictability that does count in favor of the slaves, right? So this this is a very lazy, checked out slaver that um, just very predictably does not interfere with the slaves. Maybe leaves money lying around, right? And they can um, do things like that. We think that makes exactly zero positive difference to the freedom of those slaves. We think that they're 
100% as enslaved as before, their rights are just as compromised as before because they're subject to the will of the slaver just as much as, as they would be were the slave, sorry, the slaver um, capricious and unpredictable. So it looks like the probability there can be of, of interference can be very low. In fact, much lower than it would be for people trying to live ordinary lives as people who are not enslaved, right? But we don't think that makes any difference to the liberty of the people. Why? Because what makes the difference is whether those people are subject to the relevant laws and institutions they live under, subject to the will of that slaver as property. So it just seems pretty straightforwardly false that probability is what's doing the work here. Um, could, it, could it also be okay for you, Daniel, if both the probability and the Republican thing matter independently? Like you might think the worst thing is having a master who is really likely to interfere. Um, and then, you know, a master who's not likely to interfere. That's not as bad, but it's still bad. And then the best thing is not having a master at all. I would say it's an improvement in one respect. Yeah. So, I mean, look, people's mm -hmm. lives can go, can go um, more or less well in more than one respect. So um, right. insofar as, you know, fulfilling one's aims, being happy, not su suffering various kinds of physical or psychological consequences is good. And I assume it is, right? Then yeah. um, ha having a predictable um, low interference slaver is presumably better than having a capricious um, high interference slaver, I would assume, mm -hmm. right? I, but, I mean, yeah. I, I would have thought that they were more free. Like I, I wouldn't have said that it made zero difference uh, yeah, so to be clear, I make sure the, the position is clear. We may have a real disagreement, but I just want to make sure it's clear what I'm saying. I'm not saying it makes no difference to anything relevant to their well-being. There are presumably parts mm -hmm. of well-being other than, than freedom. What I'm saying is that there is this one dimension I'm isolating as the freedom dimension, and I'm claiming that the um, sort of predictable, pred predictable low, inference, low interference of the slave owner makes no difference to that dimension of um, that person's life, even if it might make them, I don't know, happier and suffer fewer costs or another kind. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the claim. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I imagine like these slaves who have different masters talking to each other, and like, you know, the the one with the nice master says, "Oh, well, he gives us a lot more freedom than he gives you. Like, he lets us go out in the city and do what we want during the day or whatever." <laughs> I, oh, you know, yeah. I, like, natural. Can I follow up on that? Um, yeah. So kids talk that way, right? So kids will compare um, their parents' rules for them, right? And say, hey, what did your dad um, let you go to the concert, right? So when I was 16, I wanted to go to the Warp Tour, right? Um, there was a bad ice storm and my parents didn't want um, the other kids to drive, right? Um, but most of the other kids were allowed to go. They were allowed to drive to Cleveland in, this, in the ice and snow, okay. Um, we did absolutely talk about like the degrees of freedom given to us by our parents, right? So I would I probably uttered something like, I can't believe my parents um, didn't give me the freedom to do this or like, um, you guys get so much more freedom, okay? That, that seems like an ordinary use of language. But notice we're kids, right? We're not free in the sense that matters to autonomy um, as uh, citizens, right? What we mean is uh, what Locke, I gotta bring up Locke, I do Locke stuff. Locke has this distinction between liberty, which is an, an autonomous um, kind of condition of self-direction under law, and license, right, which is not being prevented from doing stuff you want to do. The increase of, you know, ability to drive to Cleveland in the snow or to um, get stuff from the, the slaver is an increase in license. What we care about as a political value is not license, but liberty. And liberty is this condition of independence from others' wills. Right. All of us as kids were subject to our parents' wills in a certain sense, regardless of whether they let us drive to Cleveland in the snow. Similarly, the, the um, slaves are subject to the slaver's will, regardless of what the slaver does or doesn't let them do. But neither are free people. Why? Because the kids are kids. They will be, hopefully, once they're not kids anymore. But the slaves are not because they're subject to slavery. And that makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, like, let's say there are these different senses of freedom, like, well, I don't see that only one of them matters. I mean, like the you know, like the other sense in which the kid had more freedom, that's that's important too, I guess. Like, yeah. Yeah, and I can grant that. I mean, it matters some. It matters the way the other um, 
parts of sort of um, I don't know, happiness I mean, or utility or something I mean, like I'm that. Not, I'm not sure that that's the, not the one that matters more, right? Like, it, you know, cause like the other kind of freedom is sort of um, abstract and like might not affect your actual life. And not sure how important that is. Um, but I mean, I don't know if we're going to resolve it, but, uh, but I also think like, you know, this more abstract sense of freedom. Oh, you never have that. It, I mean, it might even be like impossible, right? <laughs> because so, it's always true that somebody could stop you. So it's impossible if you insist on interpreting the relevant sense of able or can in this context as physically, but that's exactly what I'm denying, right? That's relevant to license but not to liberty, because what's at issue in liberty is not how causally able are you to affect the physical world in accordance with your aims, right? But what is your um, institutional standing vis-a-vis -vis other people's wills? Yeah, this, right? it's, so something, it's, it's something that's maybe primarily, it's the sense of like being a free person in the sense of possessing a certain kind of social status or standing or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's right. I think some, some earlier yeah. figures would call the the rank of a free person a dignity, right? In the sense of a status. Yeah. And that's I think exactly I mean, right. I, you know, I mean, kind of what I had in mind was I'm I'm thinking about Robert Nozick's famous tale of the slave, right? Where you know he imagines this uh, this story where you start out as a slave and then like mm -hmm. you know, you get your master becomes kindlier and you know you're still a slave. And then you know he sells you to this group of 10,000 people, you're still a slave. With just with the 10,000 headmaster and they vote on what to do with you. Well, okay. And then, you know, you're allowed to contribute to the discussions. Yeah, but you're still a slave. And then they say, oh, well, you know what? Your contributions to, to the discussions have been so valuable that, you know what? We will give you a tie-breaking vote. So if we're ever exactly deadlocked on an issue about what to do with you, 5,000 for and 5,000 against, we'll let you cast a tie-breaking vote. This has never actually happened. Um, and, you know, it never happens, but if, if it did happen, you would get the deciding vote. You, okay, you're still a slave, right? And then in the last stage, it's like, yeah, they just throw your vote in with all the others, which gives you exactly as much power as you had in the previous situation, right? And then it kind of seems like you're still a slave there. Yeah, yeah so I think that's a, um, a good case to bring up, well, not like a case, a good, um, I don't know, little anecdote to bring up. Um, I think what we should say, well, let's put aside the tie breaking thing for a second. Um, we can talk about that if we want to. I'm not sure that really matters. My view is not meant to turn on the ability to break ties or make the difference in a vote. Um, but the the progress, right, by degrees from some kind of enslaved condition, right, to some kind of um, equal membership in some kind of um, omnilateral coercive uh, state group is of course, and I think Nozick realized this, um, related to what has actually happened in history, right? So most of us, um, we're not us individually, our ancestors right, did begin, um, did come into the world enslaved to various kinds of feudal lords or landowners or warlords or what have you, right? And then we, by degrees in the actual sort of causal history of things. You know, we didn't all meet in a sort of Rousseauian state of nature. We, by degrees, um, built up into states. So something like this did actually happen, right? Um, and it seems to me the thing to say to Nozick um, is if we do in fact get to a stage, right, where all the prior slaves, and we can grant that there were prior slaves, um, are in a condition that really is one of omnilateral equal accountability, right, in a way that um, solves the state of nature, nature defects, we have made our way from slavery to freedom. And it's not clear why the causal history um, originating in a kind of unfreedom should make a difference, right, to whether the new institutional result is itself a condition of liberty. So it seems to me that what Nozick has done is told us a sort of stylized version of actual political history. Um, and we should say, yeah, we can end up free as long as the way we end up um, has the right kind of structure. Yeah, uh, I mean, it did, didn't seem that way to me. Uh, like, I mean, you know, when you think what, what he says at the end of the story is, you know, which step in this, you know, series of steps made it no longer the tale of a slave, right? And you're like, you know, you're trying, trying to name which step made that big difference. 
and there there isn't one, right? Yeah, well, I think there is one. Whenever it's the case that, um, and this is departing a little bit from Nozick, because Nozick tells the story a little bit differently with his emphasis on tie breaking and stuff. But when you get to a whatever the step is that causes you, right, to relate to each member of this collective as an equally basically accountable rights holder, right, subject to all and only those laws that are subject to that process, that's when. Right when that occurs, uh, yeah. is right, that is that saying the last stage? Because um, well, it's a version of the last stage. Um, yeah, I think it's. I'd have to get the nose out to see if it's exactly the the, the last stage, but something yeah. close. Well, to I that. mean, like I mean, I, th I think what you're supposed to intuit is, well, that made no significant difference. So the difference between having the ability to cast the tie-breaking vote and then having your vote thrown in with all the others makes no practical difference. And then you can say, oh, well, there, but there's this abstract philosophical theoretical thing that, oh, now you're being treated the same as the other people. So true, now you're being treated the same as the other people, but there's like, who cares like, about you know, that yeah. versus the immediately preceding stage where you have exactly the same amount of power and exactly the same likelihood of ever affecting the outcome of any vote. Right, well, it's important to be careful. I, I've not claimed Right, that simply being treated the same as everyone else is sufficient to make you free. There are various ways of being treated equally unfreely, right? Where there's an equality in the sense of the same thing is being done to everyone, right? And this, um, yeah. but that same, but that right. same Man. thing is yeah. not of the right kind. So, for instance, I was um, in Cuba fairly recently, and it struck me that there was a kind of equality, but honestly, not the kind that we want. Why? Because the kind of um, being equally subject to the will of various like Castro lieutenants. But I, yeah, you're not you're not equal to the government officials. I mean, well, the idea is the problem there. that you are. All right. So there's no. Again, I mean, in in the Cuban regime, they're not oh, all the equal because they're not sorry. equal to the government people. Yeah, that's right. But, uh, yeah, but I meant you know I meant like your you know equality within the context of this story like. You know, like that's that's the last thing that you needed to become not a slave anymore. Well, again, I think the the Nozick may be a little bit tangential at this point, but my my claim is that what you need to not be a slave is not just equality to everyone, right? There could take take a Hobbesian state of nature. There's a sense of deep equality of of everyone. Right? Everyone is equally both licensed to do what they think fit to survive and according to Hobbes, more or less equally able to do that with scheming and so forth. Okay, that's um, that's a kind of equal distribution of a power that's, that's equal. Um, and everyone has it the same. That's not enough. It has to be a particular kind of, um, of equality, namely equal subjection to all and only those laws, right? Subject to the process that's equally accountable to all the members. That's so it's not just being treated equally, it's being subject to that kind of um, institutional equality. That's that's the claim. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how important that is, or you know, that um that sort of legitimates it. So I'm like, um, you know, so you're you're the slave in that story, and you get to the end and you're like, well, okay, so I'm subject to the same rules as everyone else. But I don't actually, I don't practically have any power. Like formally, I get the vote, but my chance of actually affecting the laws is almost zero. So do mm -hmm. I feel free? Because <laughs> just yeah. because we're all subject to the same process. And I, mean, I think what Nozick is doing there, I, I think Nozick is is importing um, the kind of logic which leads people to insist on consent theories of political legitimacy, right? which is that um, insofar as I am going to be free um, in any kind of coercive situation, state or otherwise, that has to be because I am in control of, of like at maybe whether I'm a member, but at least I guess um, what um, outcomes right, proceed from the thing that I'm a part of, right? the kind of like signing up model. And that seems to proceed from more basic commitments that Nozick has deeper in the theory about what um, personal sovereignty and um, rights amount to. 
Um, what I'm trying to do is say, I think that whole setup all the way back to thinking about um, individual freedom in a way that has to be a matter of, in a pretty straightforward sense, just um, control the way I'm, I can control what keys on my keyboard are struck um, isn't right because that elides or fails to draw proper attention to um, the essential role of, um, of uh, power and accountability in the structure of freedom itself. If you don't think that's there, you're going to be on in Nozick's chain of reasoning and you'll end up going all the way to where he goes. So I think yeah. this is a disagreement with Nozick further back. Some, sometimes Republicans will say something like, yeah, I mean, the, <clears throat> the probability of my being like the difference making vote or whatever, of my counterfactually exercising control, of course, that's very, very small. But um, when I get the vote, I have as much input into the process as I can expect to have while being on terms of equality with others or something like that. And so that's why that is the thing that sort of constitutes me as a free and equal member of society. Um, even if, you know, the actual practical difference that it makes is, or, you know, the, 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 the chance of it making a, a, a practical material difference is very small. Is something like that what you're... Yes, yeah, so close, although... Yeah. I'm a little bit resistant to go the way that, um, for instance, the philosopher Philip Pettit goes, which is to say that what matters about the voting is that it's like a tiny little share of control, right? And it's the most we can get, so it's good enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure that's exactly promising, right? But um, Because, well, if control matters, presumably it's control that matters, not tiny little, little like sort of hunks of control, right? What, that doesn't seem super promising. Just why I'm inclined to think we should interpret our relationship to our laws and each other through the democratic process, not as one of control. I'm inclined to think it's actually not very plausible that I have a meaningful, I have control in a meaningful sense over what the state does, but rather this um, morally laden notion of accountability, right? I think that the logic of accountability is individualizable, we might say, in a way that con control is not. So, do I control the state because I vote? Frankly, I'm inclined to think no, not in any very significant sense. That isn't, it's not very plausible. Um, I think it's a mistake to hang your hat on that. But I do think that the government can hold this other normatively laden accountability relation to me, even if I don't have the control relation. So it's close to that, but I don't want to put my eggs in the control basket because I don't think that's going to pan out. Yeah, sorry, so can I sort of, sort of go back to an earlier thing that I tried to raise, like, why is it not the case that the that your rights are vitiated because a majority could just vote to violate your rights? And, and right, and yeah. no one's going to do anything to them. They're not going to get in trouble for voting to violate your rights. So I guess there's a two part answer. So one is, I don't think, and this would definitely be a disagreement with figures like Nozick, that I don't think that our rights are fully determinate prior to the democratic process, right? So I don't think that um, we have a full sort of lineup of rights that the democratic yeah. process just identifies the way that um, we could identify a statute by going through a statute book or something yeah. like that. I think I that, mean, that I would, you know, I would ima imagine that they're doing something that is a clear violation of your natural rights, even, yeah. you know. Which they can and have done, yeah, fair enough. For that case, um, yeah, that would be what I would consider using the language of my part of the book, an unreasonable um, action by, by the democratic state. And yeah, you, you have license and maybe even a duty to engage in civil disobedience there. Um, I yeah. think there are cases where you're not only permitted, but maybe morally required. Um, yeah, yeah. To do I that. mean, you know, the question is why doesn't the, just the mere possibility of that happening vitiate your rights, right? Because at the beginning, you were saying this is a defect. Right, got it. Yeah. Yeah, so I think to some extent, it does, right? Remember, I, I'm trying to endorse um, legitimacy by degrees. So I think that it's not plausible to insist as some sort of, I don't know, more enthusiastic Republicans like Rousseau or someone would insist, right? That you sort of transform all the way to pure sort of um, Republican independence from others' wills. I think that's probably not correct, or at least certainly has not come about in any 
arrangement that we're capable of. The question is whether um, by replacing the state of nature with this defect, right, with um, a duly accountable um, democratic regime and its defect, which include defects of power, right, whether we have um, become um, significantly freer and more able to respect each other as free within our rights than in its absence. It seems that for reasons I've gone through that we clearly do. I do think that um, nonetheless, there is a sense in which the majorities, um, especially very strongly unconstitutionally constrained majorities, like um, there's, there are some forms of um, majoritarian democracy that are very highly populist, right? And, uh, I tend to have very few constitutional checks on how the, uh, the majority can operate. I think that can absolutely be a source of arbitrary power. So one, we should have some kind of democratically structured majoritarian stru um, setup, right? And two, um, yeah, there is gonna be some arbitrary power in even the best democracies, but there's gonna, it's gonna be an improvement or so goes the argument. Yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, yeah. so it's gonna be an improvement in, in there being fewer rights invasions, because there's still the same, or there might be more power to invade your rights. So in so what respect is it an improvement? It's an improvement in the respect that you go from no structures of equally basically account, equal, equally basic, excuse me, accountability at all, right, to one that's quite substantial, right? So in the case of the democratic government, there are very sort of stable and robust reasons, right? Why I can be confident that um, I have standing um, not to have my right, personal possessions taken or my um, religion impinged upon or um, my speech censored, right? Those, um, I'm confident that there are very substantial um, institutional checks such that just doesn't matter what other people think about me or my stuff or my religious views. Whereas in the state of nature, I think as Hobbes correctly points out, that's just not the case, right? I've, I'm radically dependent on um, the, the world of other personal wills, right? In yeah. a way that I'm not um, in the case of a properly functioning democracy. Now, am I to some extent? Yeah, right? Um, is there a real is there a real power held by the state which could in some sense of can be turned against me with devastating results? Like absolutely, but I nonetheless do have this kind of status of mutual accountability, limited though it is, which is just wholly absent in the state of nature, right? That's the sense in which oh. there's an improvement. I mean, so you know, it sounds like it sounds like the situation is oh well, in the state of nature, every individual would have the power to invade your rights without like you know, without any institution that's supposed to do anything to them. And then in the, in a democratic government, um, individuals don't have that by themselves, but sort of like they do have this power collectively if they vote to violate your rights. And you're like, oh, and you're saying, oh, this is a big improvement. Like it's an improvement, what? Because there's, there are fewer agents who get, who can violate your rights or? No, so in the state of nature, you have a condition where, none of um, the power or no one's will, it doesn't really matter how many agents there are, right? It, none of the power of willing is subject to sort of mutual accountability. Yeah. It's just absent, right? There are a lot of wills, but that's not really the point. The point is that there are, you have this nexus of people's wills and intentions and they're all unaccountable. It doesn't matter if there was just two people or three or four, there's no degree of institutional um, sort of uh, mutual accountability. In the right kind of state, you have, as you point out, this one big massive um, organized actor, right? Which does have a kind of power, that's exactly right. But it is subject to um, very substantial mutual accountability. Now, as you point out, not complete, that's bad, but very substantial. So the condition of my will in the state of nature with respect to the other relevant wills is one of, Sort of total um, uh, dependence without any kind of um, institutional structuring at all. You move from that to a very heavily institutionally and um, sort of normatively constrained setup once you leave the state of nature. So it's not a matter of number of wills, 
or likelihood of cases of interference, but the degree to which the situation of my will with respect to others is characterized by mutual accountability. That goes up. Why? Because it goes from zero to something well above zero in um, the move to the right kind of state. That's that's the idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if maybe we should say something about what accountability means, because, you know, I could like, you know, you keep saying this, but it feels to me like the government isn't accountable to me <laughs> at all. I feel no. like if I attempt to hold them accountable, then, you know, I'm going to fail. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> like, you know, they they violate, violate my rights and I'm like, OK, you guys are going to be in trouble. And then I do what to them? <laughs> like, you know, I go and vote differently the next election and then nothing happens, you know. Right. So, yeah, so good point. I mean, so first I should say, I think to a substantial degree here, I think we agree about the seriousness of the badness of our, our current um, laws about such things as um, uh, qualified immunity or um, other practices that, I mean, this is a bit uh, simplified, but more or less let a lot of individual state actors off the hook for pretty pretty badly yeah. bungling their jobs. Yeah, you, you know, you try, try to sue them and, you know, you almost always lose because the government has made rules that, you know, you're not allowed to sue them except in like some really extreme cases. Yeah, so I think, I think that is a pretty serious injustice um, and um, moreover one that does damage the legitimacy of the state. Um, I think that's one of the, um, most, I don't know if I'm going to say it's the most, there's a lot of legitimacy damaging policy, but it's certainly a very substantially legitimacy damaging kind of policy. Um, now, one thing that complicates this a bit is that, of course, the question of to what degree do we want um, our law enforcement officers subject to um, ordinary tort law is itself um, one of the questions that's put to the democratic people, right? So in one sense, you might think, well, yeah. if, as some evidence seems to suggest, I don't really have this, these data, but suppose that people do want um, the police, say, to be more substantially um, immune. In one sense, it looks like if the laws reflect that, that's responsiveness to uh, the democratic process. But by the same token, and I'm, I'm agreeing with you here, Mike, I don't think that um, the democratic body has standing to just totally open-endedly right, determine the content of our rights um, and various kinds of um, decisions of that kind, I do think undermine legitimacy even when made in a procedurally correct way. So basically what I wanted to say is that's a major problem. It's, it's one of the major reasons why our legitimacy is so patchy. Um, yeah. And if things like, I should just note, it's very much in the cards that a state that is currently, as I say, flawed, so um, significantly patchy with respect to legitimacy, but still commanding our obligation, could become failed, right? Yeah. And um, one way that they can become failed is by um, breaking down in these basic accountability structures. So yeah. I don't, I, I don't think that we've reached um, failure in the technical sense on on account of this, but I'm agreeing that it's it's a very serious problem for legitimacy. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, like this this example of the um, the immunity, where you know it's really hard, it's really hard to sue police officers, and it's basically impossible to sue either judges or prosecutors. So, like, you know, if the prosecutor prosecuted you, even though he knew that you were innocent, and he just decided he wanted to punch an innocent person, and like he could like be on tape saying that, <laughs> whatever, you still can't sue him. Right. And he's not going to be prosecuted either because, you know, prosecutors don't prosecute each other. So anyway, OK, but but this is a good example about sort of like, um, you know, the flaws of democracy, because I bet most people would not support this. But it's still it's it's still the rule in our society, partly because, um, well, it was made by unelected officials. So it was judges who decided that judges are immune from prosecution. And, or, or from lawsuits, right? And then, you know, and then, um, okay, but it's not even clear that the politicians would have voted to make other government officials accountable because, you know, 
people who belong to an organization kind of tend to stick together. They kind of have this uh, emotional loyalty. So like the politicians who are in power, even though the voters might not like it, they're going to make rules that favor themselves, right? And then, you know, that, that just happened. And then, you know, like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe this kind of undermines the, the idea of the accountability of the government. I, yeah. I have maybe I should take the opportunity to plug my own work. Um, I, I have this paper called Prosecutorial Discretion in Republican Non-Domination, where I talk about exactly this problem with prosecutors. And it seems like the exam, I mean, the, you know, prosecutors are either elected or uh, appointed by people who are, but yeah. most of them run unopposed. Other lawyers don't want to run against them because it will hurt their careers people don't actually keep up with what the prosecutor has been doing. So voters are not very informed, even when there are contested elections. And so I try to talk about other institutional changes we might make to try to constrain them along you know, lines that you would be sympathetic to, I think, Daniel. But it does seem like the democratic process and the other institutional checks that are supposed to constrain prosecutors, things like grand juries, just don't really do all that much. Um, yeah, I, I know that paper and like it, Dustin. Oh, I cite that paper you. in a new piece I have on um, Republican criminal justice. Oh, thank, um, you. thank you. Yeah, so I, I'm inclined to agree. Um, but stepping back a bit, here's one thing that's notable, though. So we've been going through a whole list of, I think, very substantial legitimacy damaging injustices on the, the accountability side of things. But here's one notable fact. So it seems to me that in our context, I mean, in, in the American context, it is rational to reason as follows. These laws are, are bad, right? I'm going to set myself to the task of attempting to get getting my democratic fellow citizens to change things, to be different, right? To, to alter this in a more just and adequate way. If I were to start some kind of campaign or some kind of organization or run on that ticket or something, people wouldn't be like, what the hell are you doing, right? That would make a kind of sense. Um, there are other states in which that would make exactly zero, zero sense, right? You just look like an idiot, right? So if I try to do this in Russia, right? Or um, China, people would quite correctly say, do you, you may not understand what's going on here. Like, it, there's no point to this. It doesn't matter here. You just, you're wasting your time. Just why are you doing this? this is, has no connection at all to the outcome. You'll wind up in jail too. Right, you can wind up in jail. And it's notable that there are states in which that what are you doing reaction is not what you would expect, right? And it seems to me that that marks a kind of rough and ready difference between uh, communities in which democratic accountability is sufficient for that community to be merely flawed, right? Where we do have a basic institution institutional arrangement of accountability and respect for rights thereby um, worth working on from states where that's just not there. It's just a sham. Um, this is just this is just raw power. Um, and in both cases, yeah, the legitimacy is not what you would hope. It's not it's not all the way there. Um, my claim is that when we're in cases like our own where that does make sense, we, the degree of legitimacy is still sufficient to command our substantial obedience because trying to do our best within that framework is still the best way of respecting one another as equal rights holders. Um, so I think that's a nice way of framing these two kinds of, uh, or rather two degrees of failure of states to live up to the kind of model that I am endorsing. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, I definitely agree that our government and the governments of you know other other western democracies are better than most governments throughout history by a lot uh, which i would you know i would perhaps describe as well they're closer to being legitimate <laughs> although i don't think any are legitimate um anyway so uh we've been going for like an hour and 20 or so so i wonder if we should maybe wrap up yeah yeah i don't know if uh either of you have like a final point that you want to make or uh well know. i thought one thing that could be i don't know a nice note is one thing i really admired about um what you said mike is um you're drawing attention to um jury nullification as the um standing of juries sort of act as the consciences of their communities and um in trials 
even if judges take it upon themselves to say like, you're not supposed to do that or like your conscience doesn't matter here. I actually completely agree with you that um, it's absolutely um, within the rights and duties of, of juries to um, act as a conscience in that regard. I take that to be mm. actually a dimension of rule of law that institutes the kind of structures I'm endorsing. Regard and judges don't get to just announce that that's not part of, of the rule of law. Um, so yeah. I think there actually can be some degrees of, of overlap um, oh. between these positions. And that's- I'm, I'm glad we agree on that, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, that reminds me of this remark by, mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think it was by Antonin Scalia that he'd said, um, you know, just as suffrage is meant to ensure the sovereignty of the people in, you know, with respect to the legislative branch, uh, the jury trial is meant to ensure the sovereignty of the people in the judicial branch, mm -hmm. right? Meaning that they have the final say. It's it's the, you know, final authority of the jury to decide whether somebody de deserves to be punished or not. Right? Yeah, and the, the 19th century uh, philosopher Lysander Spooner, who's a, a cool read, I think everyone should have a look yeah. at that, also has some interesting arguments along these lines, arguing that um, the jury, um, serves as like sort of the the voice of the nation um when it comes to sort of like criminal conscience um so that's a cool little uh semi-forgotten 19th century root of that idea yeah 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 he's good uh yeah. you know everyone should buy our book you know is political authority an illusion a debate yeah this is the boring hardcover don't buy this one this one's like 130 bucks buy buy oh. the soft cover one yeah yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank you both uh, very much for coming on. Um, as I say, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to have uh, another discussion um, with uh, the authors of the, the debate book about God, so people can uh, tune in for that. Um, and uh, that will wrap it up.